Shavua Tov, everybody, and welcome. We are super excited to have teens from over 70 chapters from all over the United States and Canada with us. And we are seriously lucky tonight to have one of the most incredible rabbis known around the world. He's known as the most watched YouTube rabbi, Rabbi Manus Friedman. Let me just give you a little inside look to what's going to be happening tonight. We're going to be having questions from different teens from all over. And they are going to be asking questions to Rabbi Friedman. Rabbi Friedman is going to be getting two minutes to answer each question. Now, I want everyone to know that it's hard to answer a deep Jewish question in two minutes. People spend years learning to answer one of these questions, know the knowledge behind one of these questions. So to be able to get an answer in two minutes is just the tip of the iceberg. And you got to speak to your rabbi, your rabbitson, to know more of the answer. Between each set of three questions, we will be having a trivia question that go up on the board. And we will be opening up the chat box for you to be able to answer that question. There'll be a number. For example, there'll be a trivia question. I'll say number 10th answer. That person will be the winner of a $25 gift card. We'll be having these trivia questions throughout the evening. And then at the end, everyone that is on this call will go into raffle, will be raffling off about 30 Amazon gift cards live on this call tonight. So Rabbi Freeman, just want to say good evening to you. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, it's really nice to have you. Are you ready for your first question? Let's do it. Okay. So one more point. If you have a question during the night and you would like it to be live, we're going to try to get to as many questions as possible. You will see you're able to message one of the co-hosts, Rabbi Zalman Baumgarten, Zalman Baumgarten. So if you have a question for Rabbi Freeman, we're going to try to get to as many questions as we can. Message Zalman and we'll be able to try to get to your answer as the night goes on. Rabbi Freeman, your first question. Hi, my name is Yerish Spiller from Toronto, Canada, and my question to you, Robert Friedman, is uh, what separates us, the Jews, from the rest of the world? Thank you. So, Rabbi Friedman, the first question that we got tonight is what separates us Jews from the rest of the world? Rabbi Friedman, two-minute countdown has started. Okay. Now, actually, everybody can understand the answers to these questions, and you can come to the answer yourself except that when there are so many possibilities, you don't know where to start. So a two minute answer is simply telling you where to look for the answer. And then you develop the answer knowing that this is where the answer lies. What is it that makes us special? Everybody that God created was created for a purpose and a reason, which means everyone was chosen for a job. And yet we are known all over the world for all of history as the chosen people. Because the Torah says we are chosen, but we're chosen a little differently. Everyone is chosen to fulfill God's purpose. We are chosen to teach the world what God's purpose is. And that's why we were there when God came down to Mount Sinai to tell us what his purpose is. Now being chosen means the choice was already made. God didn't ask us if we want to be chosen. He gave each one of us a job. He gave us the job of bringing God's purpose to the world. Now, we can either do it or fail to do it. You know, if those are the choices, let's not fail. If you're chosen, act chosen and do your job. Thank you so much. That is a beautiful answer and uh, an answer to our first question. Okay, we're going to get right away to our second question this evening, and let's find out who our second question is. Remember before we go that uh, if you have a question, teens, and you would like to uh, address a question to Rabbi Freeman, please go to the chat box, message Zalman Baumgarten, Baumgarten and uh, we will try to get to your question and bring you live up on the screen tonight. Rabbi Freeman's second question, please. Hello, I've recently been learning Tanya and one of the things that we are learning is about how important it is for your mind to control your emotions or your heart. 
otherwise known as Moach. So my question for you today is, how does one achieve this? How do you control your heart or your emotions through your mind? Thank you. All right, that was a, a pretty uh, pretty hefty question there, Rabbi Freeman. So um, this girl's has started to learn Tanya, and I, maybe you can give a little bit of insight what Tanya is. I will give you an extra 20 seconds. Uh, what Tanya is, and uh, she says that in Tanya, it says that the moach, the brain, controls the heart, the emotions. She wants to know how does one reach that? How does one get to that to be able to uh, have the brain control the emotions? Well, the Tanya is the primary book of Chabad philosophy. And this is a Chabad program, of course. So it's very nice that she's learning the Tanya and that she's taking it seriously and trying to apply it to her life, which is gonna make her life a lot better. Her question is, Tanya says that the mind, your brain controls your heart, your emotions, which uh, is actually the natural born condition in which every human being exists. It's simply like this. Your heart does not develop feelings to something it does not know. If you don't know about something, you're not going to love it. You're not going to hate it. You're not going to have any feelings. The feelings that you have for things depends on what you know about it. So first, you have to know that it exists. Then you have to know whether it's good or bad, desirable or dangerous. If you understand that it's desirable, you're going to want it. If you understand that it's dangerous, you're going to run away from it. So in that sense, a human being is different from an animal because an animal already has instincts. There are animals that are gentle. There are animals that are predatory. They didn't decide that. That's just the way they are. But a human being can think their way to good feelings. If you think positive about your friend, you, you're going to like your friend. If you think more positive, you're going to like them more. If you start thinking negative, you're going to dislike them. So the heart is like people in a submarine. They don't know what's going on around them, so they don't know whether they should be happy, frightened. But there's one guy with the periscope, you know, that, and he's, he's taking a look at what's going on around them outside the uh, submarine. If he tells them, that an enemy ship is approaching, they'll all get frightened. If he says that, a, that a, a friendly ship is approaching, they'll all be happy. So the mind is like the periscope telling the heart that is buried in your chest what to feel, how to feel. Thank you, Rabbi Freeman. So before we get to the third question, um, thank you for the teams that are already sending in questions, and we're going to try to get as many questions tonight. We're going to do this in segments. We have one more question in this first segment to Rabbi Friedman, and then we're going to be opening up uh, the chat box where you're going to be able to try win the first $25 of tonight, and uh, that's going to be coming in just a minute. So we're going to go to our last question of the first segment for Rabbi Friedman. Let's get the question, please. Hello, my name is Aviel Parente. Uh, I consider myself to be a modern Orthodox Jew and a Zionist. Um, my question is, is, why are there some Jews that don't believe in the state of Israel? Okay, I don't think I need to give uh, repeat that question, but if anyone didn't get it, why are there some Jews that don't believe in the state of Israel? Uh, it would take way too long to explain why some Jews don't believe in the state of Israel. But the Chabad approach, our approach is this. You don't need to be a Zionist to value the Holy Land of Israel, which is our land. God promised it to us, gave it to us, and it belongs to us. So you don't need to add a political reason to love the land, to defend the land, to protect the land, we do that because the Torah says that the people of Israel, that's us, belong in the land of Israel. So it's not that we don't, that we don't have the same opinion as the Zionists. We just don't need a political movement to make Israel precious to us. Make sense? 
Makes sense to me. All right. So I think we're ready to give away our first $25, teens. Let me just repeat the way it's going to work. In just a second, I'm going to put a question on the screen. Once the question's on the screen, the chat box will be open for 30 seconds, only 30 seconds. You will have 30 seconds to write your name, your chapter, and the right number. So it's gonna be a multiple choice question. You'll write one, two, three, or four, okay? You'll write one, two, three, or four. If, if you get the right answer, but you're the right number of person. For example, we're gonna put a question and we're gonna say the 50th person or the 25th person or the third person to answer, okay? Then you got the right answer. You have your name, your chapter and the right answer. You will be the winner of our first $25 and we will announce the winner after the next segment of questions before the next trivia question. So please let's get the question up. And let's get the chat box open for exactly 30 seconds. Here goes the question. It is customary to end Shabbat by one, smelling sweet spices, two, lighting a candle, three, making a blessing on wine, or four, all of the above. You've got a message to the whole group, not just to me. You got a message to the group. The group is open for everyone to message in the group. And it's open for another 15 seconds. Name, chapter, and answer. If you just write... If you just, wow, the chat box going wild over here. If you just write an answer and not your name, not your chapter, you will not be counted as winner. And the chat box will now be closed. Thank you all for your answers. Wow, okay. Our admins will go through that and they will find out who the 10th answer was for that question. Okay, let's find out who our next question is. Uh, we're gonna go to another question for Rabbi Friedman. And let's get our question up, please. Hi, Rabbi Friedman. I know that Hashem has a goal for us, a plan for our future. Now, how do we know if we're taking the right steps to achieve that goal? All right, Rabbi Friedman, it's all yours. You can, you, if you want, you can repeat the question or uh, go straight ahead. How do we know whether we are achieving the goal for which we were chosen and for which we were created? Well, first of all, we know that we're still doing it. We're still loyal to the plan to be the example to the world for devotion to God, loyalty to God. We are still the Jewish people, which is absolutely amazing considering the difficult, torturous history that we've had. For example, I'm a Kohen, which means I'm a descendant of the tribe of Levi. That goes all the way back 4,000 years, practically. And what that means is that I am a grandson of Aaron, who was the first Kohen. He was the brother of Moshe. So I am Moses' nephew. He's my uncle. Moses in the Bible, he's my uncle. And he had a sister called Miriam, so she's my aunt. So Jews are still the people, and that itself is amazing, that we know we're Jewish, we want to be Jewish, and we want to do what we can for God's purpose to make the world a little more godly and bring heaven down to earth. Anything you do to make the world a little more like the world that God wants, you're helping him you're his partner in creation to make the lowest world that has a lot of bad in it, transforming all of that to make it the highest world, heaven on earth. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna, some of the questions, we've been flooded here with questions. So I'm going to go, uh, one of the questions just came in. I'm just gonna read it straight over here. Um, this is from Becca from uh, Northridge. Um, Becca's question is, every person is chosen for a reason to exist in the world. What about Jews or other people that commit terrible acts? Are those terrible things meant to happen by God? That's a very, a very profound question about what is destined to happen and what do we uh, choose by our own free will, which was not destined, left up to us. So most people ask the question this way. How can we have freedom of choice 
if God already knows what we're going to choose? Which actually is not a very difficult question to answer. God knowing what we're going to choose doesn't mean he made us choose it. In fact, if we don't have free choice, then God doesn't know what we're going to choose because we're not choosing. So here's how it works. When God decided to create the world, he looked through all of history, the future, and saw all the choices that we are going to make. We're going to make the choice. He didn't choose it. He sees the choices we are going to make. And based on those choices, he created a plan to make sure that no matter how bad our choices are, it will always somehow lead to the good conclusion. And that when we make the good choice and the right choice, we deserve credit for that. So actually, our choice came first. His plan is based around our choices. So for example, you decide to rob a bank, but you're the, you're the gang that can't shoot straight, so you botch it up and the, and the bank does not get robbed. So you chose, you had the freedom to choose, you went ahead and tried to rob the bank on your own free will, but you didn't succeed because God plan, God's plan does not include the success of your choice. So you had your choice, but God said, no, can't let you do that. So the, the bank does not get robbed. Or even if you decide to hurt somebody and you try, but it doesn't happen. Why doesn't it happen? Not because you're a shlomazel and a loser, but because God said no. So God says you have the freedom to choice, to choose. You have the freedom to try. It doesn't mean that you're going to succeed every time you want to be bad. So the outcome of your choice, that's God's plan. But your choice is completely yours. So how can he know what we're going to choose before we choose it? He doesn't. He knows what we're going to choose because he already sees the future. Only we don't know what we're going to choose. So he knows what we're going to choose before we know what we're going to choose. But he knows because he saw us make the choice. So are the sins part of God's plan? Yes, because God makes his plan around the sin. So he'll arrange for the person who committed the sin, who made the bad choice, to eventually regret it, to apologize, and turn the bad into good. All right. Thank you, Rabbi Freeman, for that. Um, we're just going to uh, take a... Uh... Hi, Sammy, how are you? Can you unmute yourself, Sammy, please? Um, Sammy, how are you doing? The reason why you are on the screen, Sammy, is because you are our first winner of tonight. $25 to you. You'll be contacted after as well done, Sammy. Mazel tov on that. Kala kavu to you. Good job for getting the right answer, which was all of the above for the Habdala. Well done. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi Froom, for that answer. I think we're ready to go to our next question for the evening. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Evie Gossam Hai, and my question is that if a Nazi were to go up to a Jew nowadays and ask for forgiveness for the Holocaust, is the Jew obligated to forgive him? And also just in general, what are we supposed to think about the Germans nowadays? Like, are we supposed to hate them? Hmm. Again, a very good question. Firstly, you don't forgive people who don't ask for forgiveness. That makes sense, right? If they're not asking for forgiveness, they haven't changed their mind and they're not any better than they were before. Secondly, you forgive those who committed the crimes, not their grandchildren. So who are we forgiving? The people who actually committed the crimes, who actually worked in the concentration camps, who actually murdered Jews? I don't hear them asking for forgiveness. The German people 
are asking for forgiveness, but for a crime they didn't commit. So it's a little confusing. The, the attitude is the Germans of today, if they're not anti-Semitic, you know, visibly or noticeably, then we have nothing against them. They didn't do anything. They didn't commit any crime at all. But, you know, those new Nazis, of course, they're not asking for forgiveness. So, no, we don't forgive them. So those who didn't commit the crime don't need forgiveness. And it's nice of them to ask forgiveness for their parents or grandparents. But those who actually committed the crime, if they repent, if they regret and they ask for forgiveness, we, we can forgive them. But we are forgiving our complaint to them. It's the real victim who has to give the real forgiveness. And they're not here to forgive. So we can forgive them for the pain they caused us, the survivors, the children, the grandchildren. And we're forgiving the grandchildren and, and the children of those who committed the crime. So there's still a lot of ugliness that has not been erased because those who need to forgive are not here and those who need forgiveness are not asking. Make sense? Sounds good. So I just want to throw out there again, if you have a question, please, the uh, you can message in the chat box to Rabbi Zalman Baumgarten. Zalman Baumgarten, if you have a question, we're going to try to see if we can go to some of you um, with those questions. He hasn't got so many. We got, we're putting the ones up that we got. So please, if you have a question, message, go to the chat box, message Zalman. We're going to go to our last question of this segment before we go to our uh, next trivia question for the evening. So let's get our next question, please. Hello, so my question, well, it's kind of two questions, but why does Judaism have so many guidelines and procedures? And are you less of a Jew if you don't follow all those guidelines and procedures? Uh, Ethan's questions, they're actually one question. Um, are you less of a Jew if you don't follow all the commandments in the Torah? You cannot be less of a Jew because again, we weren't asked if we want to be chosen. We were chosen. So you can either succeed or fail, but you cannot drop out. You can't decide not to be chosen. In addition, in order for us to fulfill our purpose, which is kind of superhuman, God had to give us an additional soul, a little piece of himself to uh, give us the strength, the staying power, the wisdom to survive everything that God throws at us and continue on our mission. So no, you cannot be less of a Jew. Uh, you cannot be more of a Jew. A Jew is as Jewish as you can get. Now, why are there so many instructions? It's because when God created the world, since he is perfect, everything, every detail in creation has a purpose and a function. We have commandments that cover every aspect of life, everything that God created. For example, God created us with a dependency on food. If we don't eat, you can't live. Is there a reason for that? Yes, because by eating, we accomplish something godly. And therefore, we have to eat those foods that God permits. We have to eat only foods that are healthy, that don't threaten our health. And we have to uh, make a blessing before we eat it and a blessing after we eat it, because we're doing something that is part of God's plan. Some people argue that what you put in your mouth is not part of God's plan. Only what comes out of your mouth is God's plan. So don't curse, don't be blasphemous, don't use foul language. But what goes into your mouth, that's your business. God doesn't care. But that's not possible because God created eating. It's his idea. He must be a, go a godly purpose for it. 
even getting dressed, uh, going to work, uh, how, how, you, uh, how you run your business. All of this is part of God's creation. We want to do it his way. So since it's not my idea to sleep or eat or shop or work, I ask God, how do you want me to do this? You created eating, you created sleeping. How do you want me to do this? To me, it makes no difference. I want to do it your way. And that's why there are so many instructions because there's the right way for everything in the world. Okay, thank you. So for those that just came on, we're gonna do our second trivia question. Now someone else is gonna win some money right now. And the way it's going to work, if you just came on, some of you have been asking me, what, how does it work? So we're gonna have in a second, this is not their question, this was last question. The way it's going to work is we're going to have a question that is going to come on the screen in just one second. This time, the 19th winner, the 19th winner. You saw how fast those answers came in, okay? You saw how fast those answers came in. We are going to, in just one second, open up the chat box to everyone. And we are going to open and you're going to be able to answer the question. Let's get our second question, please. One of the templates, one of the templates, in, one of the templates God bought upon Egypt was one, Scarlet Viva, two, COVID, three, or four. One, two, three, or four. Which one is it going to be? Get those answers in the box. So remember, God, you have your name, your chapter's name, and the right answer. One, two, three, or four. We're going to let's go in for 10 more seconds, and then we're going to close our chat box. And five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So if you want to just ask a, a question right now, before we go further, we're going to get some of the answers. You can raise your hand on the screen. You can raise your hand on the screen. And we're going to try come to you, or you can just put your hand up like this so that I can see you. And we'll go live to Rabbi Freeman with your question. Uh, don't be shy. I think we have someone over here. And uh, here we go. What, what's your name? Faye. Uh, Faye. And which chapter are you from? Um, Brooklyn, New York. You're from Brooklyn, CT of Brooklyn, New York. All right. You're on live with Rabbi Freeman. Please give us your question. Hi. So there are some things I don't always understand about, like, other people. One of them being is whenever like um, like when it comes to like like wrestling like willpower, a lot of people say like, oh, just because you did this, just because someone else got through this, that doesn't mean I can. I guess I'm wondering like why people feel that way or think that way. That's because you don't just because like by nature, if I do it, that, that, that specifically means that you have the capability to do it. I don't understand the, the process of that thinking. Okay. Can you repeat the question? You want me to repeat the question? Do you want to give over your question and just in, in five seconds, repeat your question? Yes. Why do people believe that just because when it comes to willpower and getting through hard situations, just because you did something, that doesn't mean like I can do you get that, Rabbi Freeman? Let me repeat the question. Tell me if I got it right, okay, Faye? Okay. Just because some people have willpower and can do certain things, why do they judge others as if they can also do it when, in fact, maybe they can't? Not everybody is as strong. Not everybody is as equal, right? Is that, that the question, question? Faye? Is that, is that the right question? I, I guess, yeah. Okay, Rabbi Freeman, it's all yours. Okay, I think I just made up my own question. Uh, yes, we judge people unfairly if we don't stop to think. The truth is, we are not the judge. I know what I can do, more or less, and so I do my best. And if somebody else is trying to do their best and it's not the same because their best is better than my best or their best is less than my best, either way, we're ultimately equal because if you try your best, that's your best. 
So we don't judge people by what they accomplish. We judge people by whether they're trying their best. So it's only God who knows whether you are sincere, whether you're capable of more. So it's really a question of what does God expect of you since he created you and he formed you and he knows you, he can judge you properly. And he does. And he's very considerate and very thoughtful in his judgment. Human beings shouldn't judge anybody. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I got this question, I would say probably about 25 times. I can't highlight every single teen I just sent in this question, but I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to repeat it um, because it seems like a very popular question. But before we do that, um, Rachel Friedman, I'm trying to find you. Could you raise your hand? Rachel Friedman, can you raise your hand? I think you might've had a question. If I see you, then I can highlight your video. Rachel, if you could just wave. Give me a wave, Rachel, on the screen. I'm still looking for you. We'll keep looking for you. And um, okay, Rachel, I can't find you right now, but Rachel, I do want you to know you are our second winner for tonight from Fairfax, Virginia, Rachel. Well done. And you are going to be receiving the next gift card uh, from the Rachel. Oh, I think I found you. There you go. Hello, Rachel. Let's just unmute you over here. Rachel, how's it feel like to be a winner? Pretty good. Pretty good. You've won yourself $25 tonight. Well done. Great with the answer. Good job. So you're from which chapter again? Fairfax, Virginia. Fairfax, Virginia. Well done, Rachel. Uh, what Congratulations. Was the answer? What was, what was the, the answer? answer? Which, which one was the, the answer? Question, which one of the plagues? Oh, I think that it was boils. That's that is correct. Boils. Well done. Well done, Rachel. Okay. So Rabbi Freeman, again, this, this question's been coming in all night. Why does God let bad things happen? Good God, why does he let bad things happen to us? I want to tell you a very quick little story that will, that will answer the question. When, when we see people who are hungry, what are we supposed to do? Feed them. Who made them hungry? Who made them poor? God. But God told us that when somebody is poor, we're supposed to feed them not justify their poverty or their hunger by saying, well, if God did it, it's okay with me. God is saying, don't be my partner when bad, painful things are happening. Be my partner only for good things. So I may need to make somebody poor, but you feed him. I, I may need to make somebody sick, but you heal him. And I may need to put people in danger, but you save them. That's your place, that's your job, that's your contribution. Now, somebody asked Elie Wiesel, who wrote many books about the Holocaust, why? Why was there a Holocaust? Elie Wiesel said something brilliant. He said, I'm sorry, but I can't tell you. The man said, you know why, but you can't tell me? He says, that's right. He said, why? Why can't you tell me? He says, because if I tell you, you'll become a Nazi. And the man said, what are you talking about? I'm Jewish. How would I become a Nazi? Listen to this explanation. You're asking me why, because it bothers you. It hurts you. You can't sleep. Six million innocent people murdered? Why? Now, I'm going to give you a good answer, a good answer. And you're going to say, oh, so that's why. Okay, I can sleep now. That means you've become a Nazi. So do you really want an answer? Do you want me to explain why it's okay that six million people were murdered for nothing? You don't want an answer. You'll be upset if I even try to answer it, because how dare you try to make it okay? It's not our job to make it okay. We don't want an answer. We just want pain and death and evil to stop. So we will continue to ask God, stop, 
enough. But we don't want it. We don't want an explanation for why it's good to suffer. No. So here's the thing. What God does, he tells us right, right up front, it's mysterious. I can't explain everything I do. You're going to have to trust me. But not just trust me. Object, demand that the pain stop. Demand and pray that this thing get over with quickly. For whatever reason the pain is there, we don't want it. We don't want it. And we'll never get comfortable with it. That's our job. So we have to keep demanding that this, this ugliness should stop and do whatever we can to make it stop. But don't explain to me why it's okay. I don't want to hear that. Okay, thank you. That, that was actually uh, very powerful. I learned a lot from that. Thank you. Um, we, we're getting flooded with questions and I want to get to every teen tonight and um, you know, bring you guys up on the screen. Uh, tons of question. Um, Rachel Kogan asked, Rabbi Freeman, what do you suggest when people start to stray away from God and faith? I suggest that we, uh, first of all, understand why it's happening. You know, if you think about it, it is so awesome that God told us who we are and what our mission is. 3,332 years ago. <laughs> We've been counting the years. 3,332 years ago, our ancestors stood at Mount Sinai and God revealed to them what their mission is, what he needs us for. We said we'll do it. I say we. Our ancestors said we'll do it and we'll pass it on to our children. Now, 3,300 years later, we're still doing it. Maybe not perfectly. Well, how could we possibly be perfect 3,000 years later? The fact that we're still doing it and trying our best, that is absolutely miraculous. We're a miracle people. And everybody knows that. Some like it, some don't like it. But everybody knows we are a miracle people. In addition to that, most of those 3,000 years were impossible, so difficult, so painful, so many reasons to give up and quit. So if somebody is not perfect and is straying from the mitzvahs, really you have to blame God for that. Why doesn't he talk to us every year? Every year we should go to Mount Sinai and hear from God again and have like a uh, progress report. But he doesn't speak to us in 3,000 years and trusts us to get the job done, which is a great compliment. But you can't blame anybody for drifting away. It's been too long. It's been too hard. So it's perfectly natural and normal for people to get discouraged. But it is absolutely amazing that we're not. We're still doing it, still Jewish, still arguing about how to be a good Jew. It's beautiful. So don't criticize anybody. Help them. Help them understand. Help them find inspiration. It's, it's a superhuman task. But we can do it if that's what God expects of us. It must be doable. Thank you. So we, again, if we're being flooded with questions. I would love to get to every team tonight, but I can't. I'm gonna, I got a question over here. Um, from someone says they actually know you, Rabbi Friedman. They've met you personally. Uh, Shana has a question for you, Rabbi Friedman. Hey, Shana, how are you? I'm good. How are you? You still have questions? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the question is, 
how do I trust Hashem when he doesn't like reveal himself? Like we all know Hashem's hidden and he's not just like a person who can like console us in hard times. So how do we um, like have trust in him? What do you mean by trust? How can you trust that he's there, that he cares, that he exists? Um, how can we trust that he's like, like, how do we know he's there for us? You know, like, he's not, we don't know us. he's actually there. So how can we trust that he's there? Hmm. Well, there, there, there are a few simple answers. Okay, let's not get to the, to the difficult ones. You're alive. You're functioning. You're pretty much safe. Where is that coming from? In other words, if God is giving you a day of life, then obviously he's still interested in you. He's still hoping f that you fulfill the purpose that he needs you to fulfill. He hasn't given up. Go to another question. And the fact that you have an obstacle, well, that's the job. Get past the obstacle, and then you've turned the darkness into light. You've turned the bitterness into sweet. And you've brought heaven down to this otherwise nasty world. So yes, the world is nasty. It's got pain. It's got ugliness. But our job is to fix it. So, you know, like walking into a dirty kitchen and saying, oh, I can't clean this kitchen. It's all dirty. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, because it's dirty. That's why we need you to clean it. So take a hint from the fact that God is keeping you on earth keeping you healthy, keeping you safe, and trusting that you'll get the job done. So he has confidence in you. You should have confidence in him. All right. Thank you for that. So before I get to the next question, I guess I'm telling you the questions are coming in and I'm proud of all your teams who are sending in questions. Thank you. Um, so just this is how the raffle at the end is going to work. We're still going to be raffling off a couple of hundred dollars over here tonight. Uh, in the chat box right now, I posted a link. It's a Google link. You cannot click on it. You got to copy it and paste it into another, either a browser or uh, another thing on your website. Once you're in there, I want you to write your name and your chapter. And we'll, this will be open for the rest of the evening. You, um, for those that can click on it, good. If you can't click on it, um, just copy and paste it into another one. Write your name and your chapter. And uh, this way you can be entered into the raffles at the end. Thank you. Um, Rabbi Freeman, we're going to go to Donald. Donald, I'm just going to get you up on the screen. Uh, which which chapter are you from? I'm from from Chai, Toronto. You're from Toronto. Okay, yes. excellent. And you have a question for Rabbi Friedman. Yes. So I have a question. Uh, so is there are there any mitzvahs that are more important than others? A very simple, direct, and important question. Are there any mitzvahs that are more important than any other mitzvahs? The answer has got to be absolutely not. Every mitzvah is something that God needs from us. And, and if God needs it, how can it be less important than anything else? They're equally important to him, so they should be equally important to us. The thing is, you can't do them all at the same time. So when you're doing a mitzvah, for that time that it takes you to do a mitzvah, you are exempt of all the other mitzvahs. So you don't have to be frantic. If you're putting up a mezuzah and you're worried, maybe I should be giving tzedakah. Don't do that to yourself. When you're doing a mitzvah, you're perfect for that moment. You don't need to do any other mitzvah. So don't, don't, you know, don't, don't get tangled up. Also, if you're going to start doing a mitzvah, you're going to start with one because you can only do one at a time. So is there a certain mitzvah that you should start with versus another mitzvah that maybe you're not ready for? And if you try that other mitzvah, it's going to become too hard and you will be discouraged. So the Rebbe, gave us a, a number of suggestions of mitzvahs with which to begin our observance of God's, of God's instructions. For example, for a boy over bar mitzvah, tefillin. It doesn't change your lifestyle. It hardly changes your schedule. So it's doable. It's powerful, like every mitzvah. 
but it's a good way to start. For girls, the Rebbe said, lighting Shabbos candles. Again, it doesn't disrupt your life, it doesn't change your life, it doesn't change your personality or your character. It's doable and it's powerful. So certain mitzvahs kind of open the door to the rest. Not that it's more important, but that in our reality, it is more doable. So don't try a mitzvah that's going to get you in trouble with your family or with your community or even with yourself. You're going to find it too hard and you'll give up and you'll quit. So be realistic. Take a mitzvah that you can do. And when you get that mitzvah down pat, then you can move on to the next mitzvah. And that way you'll grow, not get frustrated. I take that advice very much to heart and something that, um, Donald, you should know that's not just anyone, but every single Jew, I feel, can work on that every single day. Just because a guy, a rabbi, might have a nice beard, not as nice as Rabbi Friedman's, but uh, they still constantly have work to do on themselves as well. Every Jew has, has a lot of work to do. Don't make fun of me. Your beard will be white someday too working on that all right so uh we're ready for our next trivia question where we're going to open up the box and for another 25 dollars money's coming out over here guys and let's find out who our next winner will be tonight uh let's get our question please it will be winner number winner number 11 i'm being told winner number 11 for this one okay what's our question which character trait is most famous for one generosity two humility three peacemaking four sympathy okay remember your name your chapter's name and the answer which character trait is moses famous for okay which character trait is moses famous for let's get those answers in we're gonna give another 20 seconds for the box to be open or another 20 seconds for the box to be open it's answer number 11. Okay, the box is now closed and we are going to go right back to the questions. I want rabbis who are in Revitsons or on here, I sent you the link. If teens cannot, it's on the general WhatsApp group. If teens cannot put their name for the raffle, please send it directly to them. The Drop the, the Google link. This way they can put their name, the chapter, and they can be in the raffle and for prizes. Want to make sure that no one misses out. So you all have the link. If any of your teams don't get it, please send it directly. Text it, WhatsApp it to them, that they have it, that everyone can be a part of it. Um, again, questions are flying through over here. We have probably a about 200 questions here, Rabbi Freeman. You got all night? Um, but we don't have much time. <laughs> we don't have much time left as, as a lot of teens have still got to get in their homework for tomorrow. Um, one of the questions that, that's coming, I would say probably about 15 times tonight is, um, why can't women do all the mitzvahs? That's the question. I'm just repeating the question. Why can't women do all the mitzvahs? Um, specifically, lead the service, put on tefillin and mitzvot like that. We're getting a lot of those questions for you. Rabbi Freeman, it's all yours. You know, I would, be, I would be insulted or hurt if I thought God didn't know who I was, what I was, and didn't care. If he made me Jewish, I would expect him to give me Jewish activities. If he made me male, I would expect him to give me male activities. If I were female, I would expect that God knows that and that he created me to be who I am purposely. So why would he give me things to do that are not female or not appropriate for a female when he knows that I am female? So it's actually a compliment and it's part of what makes God lovable is that he takes everybody seriously for who they are, how they are, what they are, because obviously, that's what he needs. He needs me to be male. He needs my sister to be female. He needs Jews to be Jewish. He needs non-Jews to be non-Jews. Nothing is an accident and nothing is unimportant. Women are given the mitzvahs that are important and necessary for their role in creation. You're not a female by accident. You're not a female by mistake. Being female is important to God. 
so he adjusts the commandments accordingly. The mitzvahs that women do are best for them. The mitzvahs men do, best for men. The mitzvahs Jews do are good only for Jews. And the mitzvahs non-Jews do are good for everybody, for the universe, because they are the vast majority of people. So take it as a compliment that God, God is serious. God is serious about his creation and nothing that he creates is not important to him. So women have a feminine role, men have a masculine role. The confusion that's going on in the world today about gender, it's so painful to watch. To be confused about something so basic in ourselves means that we're really losing it. We don't know who we are. We don't know why we are. This is not good. So God is doing us a huge favor by taking our gender seriously. Obviously, he created it, so it must be serious. And to us, that is a huge compliment. Nothing about us is unimportant. All right. Thank you for that answer. Um, I'm going to unmute someone here. Yuval, you're on the screen. Uh, and the reason why you're on the screen is, Yuval, you won that round of the trivia. You got really? $25. Yes, really. Where are you from, Yuval? Toronto. Toronto. Wow, I got a lot of Canadians on it tonight. Well done, yeah. Yuval. Congratulations. Mazel tov. Great. Thank uh, you. Well done. Okay. Um, let's see over here. Did you have a questions for Rabbi, uh, for Rabbi Friedman? Let's see. Over there, if they come up, I think there was someone that we had just a second ago. We'll just try to spotlight them. Okay, let's get Kaylee's question up. If souls are recycled, when Mashiach comes, what body will the souls enter? Fascinating question, isn't it? We've all been here before. We've all had a, a life before because it takes more than one lifetime to complete our job and our mission. So when we passed away last time, we still had unfinished work. That's why we were born again, given more time to complete our task. This is probably the third or maybe even more that we've been here. So when the soul comes back to the body, which body is it going to come back to? Like a multiple choice question. Your first life, your second life, your third life, or your present life? The answer is all of the above. A soul can give life to many bodies because the soul has many faculties and each faculty can give a person a life a purpose, a mission, a life. So in one lifetime, you excelled at kindness, but you weren't very uh, compassionate. In another life, you were compassionate, but you weren't very strict with yourself. In the fourth life, you get to finish off and put the, the, the perfection, the finishing touches on all the past lives. So each soul, I'm sorry, each body will get that part of the soul which succeeded, which was successful in that body. So simply, said, simply stated, every body, physical body, that served God and did mitzvahs, and of course every body did, deserves to be rewarded. It did the mitzvah. Without the body, the soul can't do a mitzvah. You can't light a candle without a body. You can't give tzedakah without a body. You can't eat matzah without a body. Um, so when does the body get rewarded? The soul goes to heaven and gets some of the reward. But when will the body get its reward? So every body did a mitzvah or two deserves to be rewarded. So a lot more than a mitzvah or two, a lifetime of mitzvahs. So each body will come back, 
the same soul will give life to three, four, five bodies, and they will all receive their reward. All right, thank you. Teens, I, I'm really trying to get as many people as possible and time is running out over here. I just wanna remind you, there is a link we're going to, uh, we'll have the link is in the drop box, in the chat box, as well as um, we're gonna be putting it there again. So it's right at the beginning of the chat box, as well as your rabbis and Rebitson also have the link. I need you to get into that link. You click on it if you can, if you can't take it, um, and uh, we're going to put it there again right now. There you go. It's right at the bottom of the chat box for everyone to see. Click on that link if you can. If you can't, copy it, okay? Or ask your rabbi or rabbit some for it. We're going to give a few extra minutes for the raffle to make sure every team that's on here gets a chance to get into the raffle tonight. We're going to be doing the raffle live over here. Um, and um, we're going to do another trivia question now for another $25. And let's find out, let's find out what our next trivia question is. Okay, we're just waiting for our trivia question to come up. This one's me for another $25, and you're going to have that chance to win it tonight. Okay, just a second reminder, put your name in there to be able to be in the raffle. And we have a really special announcement coming up right after this question. Okay, so this one is going to be the answer who answers number 16th. Number 16th is going to be the answer for this. The 16th correct answer, and our question is, a Jewish wedding includes all these customs except, one, a glass is broken, two, the ketubah marriage contract is given, three, the ceremony takes place under a chuppah, four, a bag of spice, spices are passed around. Remember your name, your chapter's name, and the right answer, number 16 is going to be the winner. Answer number 16, chat box open for another 10 seconds. Another 10 seconds, and let's close the chat box. Let's close the chat box. That's really good. Okay, before we make the special announcement, before we make a special announcement, um, let me just ask uh, over here in the studio, do you have the uh, special announcement ready? You have something ready? Okay, guys, we're gonna just real quickly, something really cool is about to come up on the screen. Just take a real quick look. We've got lighting. Uh, Fireworks going on over here for this special announcement. Okay. That night in Times Square, the Seton International Shabbaton with that Hasidic superstar. His name is Benny Freeman. He's actually Rabbi Manus Freeman's son. And next Monday night, so a week tomorrow night, he will be performing a live concert for Seton. Not only performing a live concert for Lagba Omer, he will also be doing taking some questions about Jewish music, about his role in Jewish music, how he got into Jewish music. It's going to be an incredible night together with a illusionist, together with Rabbi Jacobson will be sharing some thoughts. It's going to be an incredible evening for Seatine. Your rabbi will share information in the coming days for you. We don't miss it. It's going to be an unbelievable program, and we can't wait to see each and every one of you there live with Benny Friedman. Okay. By the way, uh, Rabbi Friedman, maybe you can share with us. Um, Rabbi Friedman, maybe you can share with us what is it like to have a Hasidic superstar as your son? Listen, I got to tell you, I have never used him to promote myself. 
I'm not riding his coattails. Um, he has a very good joke that he says, he was born in Minnesota. And he says, you know, I'm not the only famous Jewish singer from Minnesota. There's also Bob Dylan. He says, between the two of us, we have sold millions of albums. <laughs> That's right. He's not only a good singer, he's also funny. He is, he's, he's good. I wonder where he gets that from. So uh, Rabbi Freeman, just maybe you can share with them, is, is as a father of a, do you ever get, do you ever people come up to you and say, is Benny Freeman your son? Do you ever get that? And then what is it like uh, to, to have, a, have, a, have a son that's a celebrity in, in, in the Jewish world? Well, I got used to it because I have a brother who's an even bigger celebrity. So I got used to being asked, are you Avram Freed's brother? And then Benny came along, and now the question is, are you, are you Benny Friedman's father? Nice. So, do so I hope to have a grandchild, and they're going to ask me. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's in the family. You know, there's lots of singers in the family, no? There are. Very nice. All right. So, guys, that will be next Monday night. Hannah Covell from Montgomery County. Can you wave? Hannah, can you wave to me? Hannah, where are you? We're looking for you. Wave your hand that I can find you. Oh, hi, Hannah. How are you, Hannah? I'm good. Do you know why you're on the screen? Because I won. <laughs> you won? That is right. All right. Who's your rabbi? Um, well, I have... Lots of I'm, rabbis. I'm between multiple Chabad, so... All oh, right. You're a, regular, you're a regular Jew, then. <laughs> All right. Hannah, well, congratulations. Mazel tov. You have won a $25 gift card. And now... <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, I think we're almost ready for the raffle. We're, gonna, we're almost ready. So we're, what we're going to do is um, we're going to share our screen. What you're going to see is everyone that put in their names, let's get the sharing screen that we can share. We can explain while it's going on. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Rabbi Arnstein and Rabbi Baumgarten to write down, write down the names as they win. So you will see a screen. Here are all the thousands of names that came in from all of us. You can see with just all the names. We're going to spin this wheel. Okay, and we're gonna find out when. Now, if I'm not mistaken, Rabbi Belgoff, you just let me know how many, how many raffles we're gonna do in a row now. If you could just send me a message exactly how many raffles we're going to do, how many teams are right now going to win? I'm waiting for your message. Waiting for your message over here. Okay, 30 teams are gonna win now $25. We're gonna do this real fast. Let's get the winning, let's get that wheel spinning. Here we go. That wheel is spinning. Put your camera on and maybe I can find you if you're a winner. And let's find out who our first winner is. <laughs> who is that? There you go, Abby Acker from Boca Raton, Florida. Okay, Rabbi Balgott and Arnstein, please write down those names. Remove and let's continue. 29 more to go, we gotta do this fast, okay. Are you gonna be the next winner? Let's find out. Ooh. Oh, it looks like a <laughs> No way! Look at that! You guys are related? Oh my god. You guys have some luck going over there. Okay, the winning, the spinning wheel is going. We got two from Boca Raton, Florida. Okay, who's our next winner? Ooh! Who's going to land on? Let's find out. All right, Dina, you are our next winner. Dina, you are our next winner. Okay, this is going real good. This is going real good. Okay. Great! Well done, you are our next winner. Shkoyach, mazel tov. This is getting fun. Money's coming out over here, another $25. Another $25. Who is this gonna be? Hey, from Wilmington, Illinois. Okay, this is fun, this is fun. This is fun. Okay. The names are all being written down over here. Here we go. Let's find out who that is. Yair, you asked the question tonight. Well done, look at that. You are now a winner. Good job. Let's see if we can get another winner in there. You can keep sending in names. You haven't sent in names. You can keep sending in names. And we will be adding that. We will add that. Okay, Todd, you are our next winner. We're adding in the names. They're adding in the names in the back end. Keep, if you haven't yet, 
If you haven't yet put in your name, please put it in. We will be adding it in there. Keep the wheel rolling. And Rabbi Freeman, we have one more question to end off the night with you. So don't go anywhere. There's being someone is being saying, please, please. So we're going to come back for that last question. <laughs> oh, you're from Stony Brook. All right. Mazel tov, Orly. Okay. Who's next on our winners list? These raffles are going. <laughs> From Huntington County, Mazel Tov. Congratulations on our next winner. Okay, let's see how many more do we have going over here? Are we keeping count? We're just giving away money all night. Hannah <laughs> Kavah, you won already tonight. You got $50 tonight. Make sure you give charity to your rabbi. You know how much charity you got to give? 10%. Your rabbi's calling you tonight. Well done, Mazel Tov. Okay. Who's next? <laughs> Noah. All right. <laughs> and it's actually from Potomac, Maryland. Good job. Let's keep this going. Let's keep this going. Let's keep giving away money. Sounds like Las Vegas to me. This is fun. Great neck. Made up from great neck. Muzzle tub. Muzzle tub. Good job. All right. I'm waiting for them to give me an answer. How many more we got? Jacob from Boca Raton. Jacob from Boca Raton. I'm waiting to find out the answer. How many more prizes are going to be given away here tonight? We have 15 more. 15 more? Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Rivka from Potomac. Rivka from Potomac. Unless, unless, um, yeah. Okay. There we go. Elijah, well done, well done. Congratulations. Okay. I think we have 13 more. 13 more winners tonight. 13 more winners tonight. 13 more winners tonight. Who is it going to be? Well, there's no name over there, so we're going to do that one again. We'll remove that and we'll do that one again. We'll come back to it for the for the last few in a minute. We're going to stop sharing for a second. I want to give a big shout out to Rabbi Benji, who had a baby boy yesterday. Mazel tov, a C-teen family. Mazel tov to Rabbi Benji. Simitov, um, mazel tov. What a beautiful simcha in the C-teen family. I think before we do the last 10 raffle, we're going to go back to Rabbi Freeman for one last question. Yeah, I'm going to do this. If there's a teen that wants to ask it again, I over here, I've got so many questions from you. Just raise your hand. Um, Jacob Brooke, you're going to be live on the screen for the last question of the night to Rabbi Freeman. Jacob, it's all yours. Hello, Rabbi. Jacob, you're a little bit choppy. It's hard to hear. I turned off my video, so hopefully that will make it better. Can you hear? We're going to try it. Try it. We'll try and get it. Jacob, I, I I sent it to you in a in a message. You sent it to me in a message. Okay, we're gonna try this. As Rabbi Freeman said earlier, God has a plan, and by whatever choices we make, God will make sure we get to where we need to go. If we know God will direct in the way He wants, what incentive do we have to do good? Especially if we know we'll get there anyway. I hope I got it right. I hope I got it right. It's a very cool question. Good question to ask. Rabbi Freeman? Yes. There's a huge difference between getting there despite you or getting there because of you. 
Of course, God is going to succeed in his plan one way or the other. But are we going to succeed in being his partner? So that makes all the difference in the world. We're not trying to change the world, save the world. God is not going to let the world be destroyed. The question is, will I fulfill the purpose for which I exist? And that's all that makes real difference in my life. It's what I can do to be a partner with God. So if God succeeds despite my bad decisions, I have not done my job. And that's what Mordechai said to Esther when he wanted her to go to the king and risk her life. He said, don't think you're saving the Jewish people. You know, don't become a martyr and don't get illusions of grandeur. You're going to save the Jewish people. The Jewish people are here forever, and they're going to be saved one way or the other. But you became queen for a reason. You've been sitting in the palace for 10 years, and now the moment has arrived that will explain and justify why you're the queen, why God needs you there. So if you go to the king, you will fulfill your mission. If you don't, you will fail in your mission. And for that, you should be willing to risk your life because your mission is your life. So we just need to know that we contributed to making the world godly, not obstructed it, and God had to get around us. That would be embarrassing. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi, Rabbi Freeman, and thank you for your incredible uh, advice tonight, your incredible answers, and uh, we've all gained so much from it, and uh, we thank you very, very much, and um, Rabbi Freeman, again, has an incredible amount of videos on YouTube. He's the most watched YouTube rabbi. Um, rabbi Freeman, any websites for them if they want to learn more to see more videos and more answers and some questions? It's good to know. It's, it's good to know. It's good to know.org, correct? There you go. It's good to know.org. Put it in your phone. I know at home right now, uh, we have some extra time, just a few minutes here and a few minutes there. I got to tell you guys, you have Torah in the palm of your hand like you've never had it before. And uh, Rabbi Freeman, it's incredible to listen to his videos. I listen to them on a daily basis and get inspired. You should too. It's uh, something that we have to plug into more to hear Rabbi Freeman and his advice, his knowledge. It's goodtoknow.org. Take one video a day, one video a day and less than a day and um, will enhance your life in an incredible way. So thank you so much Rabbi Freeman for sharing your evening with us and spending time with us tonight. Thank you so much. It was only 18 minutes worth, <laughs> two, two minutes per question. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.